Hey YouTubers, this is your boy C, coming to you from outer space at the behest of my co-workers uh, who love hearing about 80s nostalgia, uh, some 70s nostalgia because that's where when I'm from. Uh, I finally broke down and decided to start these videos. Now, uh, we're going to touch on a few things, all things 80s. A little 70s, a little 90s, but mostly we're going to that era. Uh, this is not going to be the first video that you've seen, but one of them. And if anything, maybe you learn a different way of doing things. This is something I've wanted to do for some time, which is modding an Atari 1T600 system to make it work with a modern television. Now again, not the first one. One of several, but maybe you see a different way of doing things. As long as it works, that's what matters. Now, uh, in this video, we're going to do the 2600. Uh, there will be other videos where we're going to do the Atari 5200. Uh, so make sure that you stay tuned in and you look for those as well. Uh, but in the meantime, we're going to be breaking down this 2600. And for those of you who are wondering, this is the inaugural video of C's YouTube channel and this is the Corona edition for you guys out there uh, so keep watching and maybe show you some new tricks or maybe just give you a more clear explanation of how this is done so keep looking Alright guys, so this is the tools that you would need, or at least this is one I would recommend, a helping hand. These are fantastic when you do the soldering. Trusty screwdrivers of all types, even though you only really need Phillips, but it's good to have. Multimeter, always good to test power. If you want to do it easy and right, get yourself a drill. You will need to drill some holes. And lastly, and certainly not least, and this is for us old school brake fix technicians, soldering iron, solder, solder sucker. If yours has a pair, if you got a pair of dikes, what the hell, or needle nose pliers. You don't need this damn thing unless, you know, you got butter fingers and stuff slips out of your hands and maybe you want it. Uh, but other than that, you're definitely going to want. And the wire strippers as well. So everything here will get put to use. Um, again, so you got your, your needle nose over here, sorry. Your dikes over here. Here's your soldering iron. Your solder. Wire strippers. And solder sucker. So for those unfamiliar with the Atari 2600, this was the final run that was made by Atari of the 2600. As you can see, it says it right on the back. This guy's made in Taiwan, so at least you know it wasn't made by little kids in a sweatshop at the time. Uh, and it happens to be the only model that had an LED indicator, which lets you know that it does have power, either does or does not. The original 2600 made in the 70s, the Woody, as a lot of people call it, the VCS, um, there was two versions, one with the six buttons and one with four, just like the Junior. The one we're working with is the Junior. In my opinion, it's definitely the prettier of the 2600s. It was kind of Atari's last hurrah. And uh, we're going to test it for power first and foremost, just to make sure that it is working. As you can see, the power went on and went off. So let's see if the problem is with the adapter itself, hopefully, and it's not with this little guy. 
Okay, so using our trusty multimeter, we see that this thing is toast. Hopefully you can see focus on there. It really doesn't matter which side of the prong you test it as long as they're not touching each other because you know then you would get that. So we're doing a little test here. We got nothing. So this it's safe to say this AC adapter's toast. Alright, so what you're looking at is the back of the Atari. Uh, this is the front. This is the rear of the machine, if you want to look at it here. Um, and again, we're doing this mod because uh, this era, uh, particularly, this one, although this one was made in the 80s, uh, the original VCS Atari 2600, the Woody, as most people, some people know it by, uh, as you look right here, was RF. Now why was this not made with components? Simple. TVs didn't have them back then. Uh, TVs used VHF and UHF, and they were screwed on. And how do I know this? Well, A, I was alive back then, and B, my uncle used to own one of the absolute best TV repair shops in town. So we saw TVs all day, every day, like they were going out of style. And I don't think I ever saw a TV from that era with any type of components. Now, I did see TVs with coaxial RF, uh, but most TVs from that time period were RF uh, through VHF, which would have been, um, if I remember correctly, it was channels 2 through 13, but I could be wrong. Someone with a clear memory, a little bit older, could probably correct me if I'm wrong. And then uh, anything from 14 forward was considered UHF, uh, and they were screwed on. So if you remember these guys, they had a little adapter which had two little prongs, and at the end of those prongs, they were shaped like little U's. Those were to screw in. If you were lucky, you had a TV with a coaxial RF, and you had the little round bulb that plugged into that, or screwed the little prong screwed into, and you can just plug it into the back of the TV. So that is why. Now, these guys are simple beasts. They got one, two three, four, five screws in the back. Plastic on them is okay. It's not bad. This one has lived indoors his entire life. Some of these may have been living in a garage over the last 20, 30 years. Who knows? You don't want to be too rough on them because you can crack the pegs on the inside. Once you crack them, there really is no going back. Uh, what I suggest is you take it, you give it a little bit of a twist towards just a little bit of a twist as you're tightening and then loosen it. And if you don't hear that little crack, when you hear that, that lets you know that this system has probably never been to open. I know this one has never been open because I've actually, this is my own personal machine that I've had for over three decades. So no need to bore you with the rest of the process. Uh, we'll go ahead and skip to the next part of the video. Another thing is also, and I did not break these, these happen to just be this way. There's a tab here, tab here, and a tab here. These tabs have to be gently pulled out. Uh, as you'll see, if you're looking right in there, you go this way on this one. This guy goes that way. This guy goes this way. So once you get these off, there's also a ribbon back here that I'll show you next. All right, congratulations. You are inside the 2600. Uh, so now, here's the ribbon I was talking about. So be very, very careful removing this ribbon. Just very gently pull up and out. Now this ribbon controls the select and the reset button. If you look this is your port for the cartridges. This is your on-off switch. Okay. Uh, and this guy back here, this is the power port. This is where you would connect the power supply. Uh, if you lose power on these systems, chances are it's one of basically three things that are wrong. Either 
this guy might have fried or been corroded. Uh, as you can see with this guy here, probably could use a little bit of, just a little, a little wet sand. Just gently, very lightly to get a little bit of the three decades of crud off of it. Your on-off switch could be bad. You might have to replace this guy. Be very careful when touching capacitors of this size. Um, this is not going to kill you, but it, it'll definitely hurt like hell. And of course, as we had the experience earlier with the power supply, so you, in that case, we have a replacement. We're lucky. Uh, I'm not saying use a universal. It's better than nothing. Uh, you can find replacement parts. Uh, I believe uh, Atari Age uh, is one of them. Uh, Atari Age actually sells, uh, or I don't know if they sell them directly, but I know it's uh, through their website. You have forums. You can discuss these things with other guys uh, and gals. As well as you can get parts. Maybe if you break this one, you can find this guy or find it used, or you can find a parts 2600. You can also get new games, which is really cool that you can do that, as well as reproductions of old games. Um, 2600s are fairly inexpensive. Um, you can find stuff at swap meets, flea markets, uh, stuff people are just giving away for this one. When we get to the 5200, a little bit different story. 5200 um not as popular but way better in quality you'll you'll see why those of you uh that are well aware you know the you know the why um so we've got this guy off so we just uh put the case over to the side and uh now it's uh it's time to get to work focus on this guy all right it's shout out time uh, shout out goes to VintageGamingAndMore.com, Pags35, as he's better known on eBay, uh, for providing, I shouldn't say providing because I paid for it, but technically he did provide it because he made it. Uh, the kit, uh, this is actually the pre-assembled kit. Uh, yeah, you could save a few bucks getting all the pieces yourself, um, but why? I mean, if, a few bucks, uh, I'm sure he doesn't mind the extra bucks to do this for you, and it's less time that you gotta spend doing this crap. Um, especially if your soldering skills are not that good. Um, I unfortunately, I, I, I suffered an injury years ago, which uh, doesn't give me a whole lot of feeling in my left hand. Um, so the less work I have to do, the better. Uh, as you can see, it does have a video lead, the two audio leads. Now, we'll get to this later. Yeah, this is a mono system. So how do you get stereo sound? Truth is, you really don't. Uh, the only thing you're really shooting for is to get audio out of both ports. And we'll kind of address that later. Um, but uh, this is going to be the little board. This little itty bitty thing here. If you find them on eBay, they look like they're about this big. But really, this is it. This is what's going in here. Um, so first step is first. There's these little tabs. If you can see them right there. Let's see if I can get my uh, my camera to focus a little better. Right there. You see the tabs here? here and there's three down here on the bottom there's another two on the right or left because this is the bottom of the board uh, and then the ones up on top you got another total of three uh, so you twist these little guys off this shield it's out of there you don't have to put it back if you don't want to um, pags suggest that you just throw it in the garbage um, I'm, I have a feeling I know why, and it has to do with fitment issues and the, the new board. Um, but it doesn't mean we won't make an attempt. It's also kind of ironic that the, uh, the, sh the heat shield here kind of looking at you like saying, What the fuck are you doing? Okay, so now you're looking at the 2600 board with the shields removed. Uh, what you want to focus on is the bottom right hand corner here. If we come a little closer, and let the camera focus ever so slightly, there's going to be two pieces that you're going to want to remove, and this is where your dikes come into place. This here, this is the Q4 transistor. So this guy has three little pegs that you want to just take your little dikes and cut this guy off. The next guy you want to cut off is the R56. R56 is actually this guy right here. Um, always remember, 
brown, green, brown, green, brown. This is the sequence. So you want to remove the brown one in the middle. You want to get this guy out of here. You want to make sure you clean off these little holes uh, and clean off this guy as well. This is what that uh, soldering gun and solder sucker are going to be for. And the reason being is because you're going to do some soldering over on this guy. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and remove these two guys. Remember, this one here is the R56. If you want to look at it, it is right here, this guy. This is your R56 that you want to remove. And the Q4 is this guy, as you can see, Q4. Don't make the mistake of thinking it's this guy. This is actually the Q4 here. Okay, so the R56 has been removed as well as the Q4. One thing I did fail to mention earlier in the segment right above, the C33 capacitor, which is the same color as this little green one here, which I'm assuming is C34, this has to be removed. And the R17 resistor as well has to be removed. Also right over here in this, this little hole is going to have to be opened up. Uh, so once you got this process in place, now you can start to commence to solder your board. Okay, so here is the first part of the soldering. Um, I know it's upside down, but you should be able to... Well, maybe if we could focus a little better. It cannot. Oh, there it is. You could barely see this is the input part of the board. Okay. On the resistors and capacitors, we moved. Um, you can clearly see this is going to. This is your video. It's ground right to the board. Okay, and uh, the audio. This is power, which goes there to that, where the Q4 was, and this is actually audio. Uh, this is the first part of the soldering. The next part of the soldering, which is going to be this side of the pigtail. This is going to go to these guys. Alright, so we're starting to get down to the final part of the video. And everybody needs a template. Because you want to know, more or less, where you're going to place these guys. So we're going to place these guys. The ideal location um, would be right about there. And if I'm not mistaken, I believe this is the reason why they recommend discarding the shields that sit here and the one that goes underneath. You figure this would sit up just a tad. Not too bad. I am gonna make the you know the attempt to to do it. Uh, at least the bottom shield, uh, but the top shield. Considering that when you finally have these together, you have to bring the ribbon back in and the board. Remember that the other end of this guy over here is gonna connect over here. Uh, I looked at doing it on the inside here. And that's kind of where I figured this is why it was recommended just to throw away the shield. The shield probably is going to bring it a little up. A little, just enough where, just to give you an idea what these guys look like. Okay. Let's see how, how much they protrude out, or inward I should say. Uh, so it might touch the board, you can cause a short... Uh, not good. You don't want to keep opening and closing this thing. Because again, remember, this plastic is over 30 years old. Uh, it's not considered the sturdiest plastic by a lot of people. Uh, and mind you, this particular one has lived indoors its entire life. Uh, if you ever find any of these, I'm pretty sure that a lot of them, that's not going to be the case. So, this template here for the audio and video... Uh, let me show you where I got it from. And this, this little guy is going to come into play later on. 
right there. Uh, just put the slab of tape right over that. Uh, just kind of colored it in using a marker just to get the right feel. And translate it to there. Now you need your universal. Uh, the tip itself is quarter inch. Do not go past quarter inch or then you may have some fitment issues. Uh, they are about a quarter inch. Don't go past that. Uh, in some cases, some recommend starting with a one eighth inch bit and then moving up to a quarter. My hand is still pretty steady where I can actually, you know, get the quarter inch in there. So I'm going to go ahead, get the drilling and then start to try to wrap this up. Okay, so now we're looking at the board. This is pretty much the finished product. Uh, as you can see, the video, the audio. Uh, as it was, as I said earlier in the video, this is a mono system. Therefore, if you noticed the right there, this is going to be the audio spans across both left and right audios. The point is to get audio out of both of these. Yeah, it's going to be one audio, but it's better than mono audio. Than mono mono, I guess you can, can you call it mono stereo if you want. Then of course the video to video and the ground just grounds to all three. We connect the ribbon cable back. That should be ready to go. You know, uh, test your wiring. Make sure you know you're secure. Uh, it does recommend that you put the board itself towards the uh, bottom right hand corner of the top panel, which is the top panel, as close as you can to it. Uh, remember, this is going to flip over this way, uh, so you just want to make sure your on-off switches are aligned. Uh, next will be the fun part, which would be trying to put together the the shields, trying to put the shields back on. Uh, I can totally see why the top shields will probably not work. As you remember, the top shields go over this way here, and we have this guy here. Um, unless you're going to carve into that shield uh that's not going to work anymore because we've just you know joined two parts of the board here and this this part here was separated by its own shield uh so but the bottom shield uh we could see the uh, only problem i would i would anticipate would probably be because of this little guy here uh, i would bring this guy up slightly uh they would probably cause issues with with the uh the connectors here uh, grounding out on the board itself doesn't mean we don't try uh, at least I'm gonna try it I'll let you know how it goes if it's pass or fail uh, one other thing be I would I would probably before closing the system back up pop a cartridge in that you're most familiar with uh, I like to use pitfalls an example because we all know more or less pitfall Harry uh, does not blend into the background uh, and right over here, this is the uh, potentiometer here, I believe it's called a potentiometer. Uh, this is what, how you tweak the color that's going to go here. So uh, try it out first, see if it works, and then tweak your colors here to where more or less you think they're supposed to be. And at that point, close it back up and get to gaming. Okay, well, contrary to popular belief, you can return the shield back on. A little bit of modification. You will have to cut this piece out so that the wires can go through. I've selected this location here for the chip. Uh, the chip sits here very nicely. It shouldn't be affected by anything. Uh, one other thing, the L6 is optional. You do not have to actually have this. We're going to leave it in. It really doesn't uh, do anything special or get in the way. Okay, so here's the 2600 hooked up. I had to borrow my kid's TV here because I, I honestly, I've totally forgotten, didn't realize that my uh, monitor there doesn't have component plugs. Uh, for those of you who are not aware, looking here... Nothing better than a Sega Master System controller for 
a lot of your Atari 2600 games. It works absolutely beautifully. You can also use a Sega Genesis controller if you have one. Um, if you've got the traditional controller, this one here is actually from an Atari XC computer. I have to repair the original black one that came with the 2600. But we're at the moment of truth now. This bad boy is hooked up and ready to go on this little machine. Uh, now, I kind of divided it amongst three categories just to get a baseline here, an idea. We have Sears and Roebuck, which is this Pac-Man now. It's a pretty, pretty banged up uh, cartridge here. Honestly, it should probably get a good cleaning. Uh, but I got a nice clean one here of Missile Command. This one is in excellent shape. These are the Sears and Roebuck. These are you're talking about your original Atari cartridges, your black labels, your kind of cool illustrations. And we got some aftermarket. Return of the Jedi. I played this a lot. The Death Star battle. Uh, good old Return of the Jedi has a lot of bright colors, pretty. Uh, and I believe this is actually a Parker Brothers cartridge. Whoops. Yeah, right there. Parker Brothers. It's aftermarket. This was New School 2600. I uh, just kind of grabbed Dark Chambers here. These red label. This was towards the end of uh, Atari's run here. Uh, as you can see, these were actually... Uh, made in Hong Kong, this particular one here. As opposed to these, pretty sure, if you could zoom in on it, these are made all in the States. Missile Command, Pac-Man. Uh, well, let's get to it. Without further ado, let's pop in. Let's go with Pac-Man, the classic. Um, even though the 2600 version of this sucks ass compared to the arcade, 5200 version is like spot on arcade. Now let's go ahead and just pop it in. Flip it on. As you can see, we got a little bit of uh, ghosting there on the page, it looks like. Or I shouldn't say ghosting, but some bars going up and down. Uh, this could be the cartridge itself. I'm pretty sure if I remember Pac-Man correctly, the bars here should really be orange and not not green. So this could be an issue with the cartridge itself. Um, like I said, Pac-Man always looked like shit anyway on uh, the 2600. Let's try Missile Command from the same era. Let's see how that fares. Now mind you, this is on standard definition. Ooh, we have the same exact horrible bars on the system. Um... Uh, not not looking very good on this upgrade at all, to be honest with you. Uh, makes me wonder if this is even worth your while. This this honestly looks like shit. Uh, to get get this, you know, you might as well stick with the shitty RF if you, if you absolutely had to. Um, this is very, definitely not not working out. Let's look at Return of the Jedi. Same problem with Return of the Jedi. Okay, as that did not work out so well. So back to the drawing board. A little research on the junior. Two things make it different than the others. A, it doesn't crank out enough power compared to the others, and B, it doesn't have the same level of shielding. So one solution. Standalone connection. We popped Pac-Man back in there. The other solution is disconnect the Cody box. Could be a bit of a pain in the ass, but maybe something just to have to live with, as uh, it's prone to interference issues. And here we go. And there you have Pac-Man. No bars. Now, again, I'm pretty sure I remember that these are supposed to be orange, but whatever. A little bit of adjustment with the potentiometer to fix that. Let's jump to Missile Command. Pretty. Clear. Let's go to Return of the Jedi. Just a whole arc of things. Look at that. Just 
excuse my kid's fingerprints here. It is her TV after all. And now the one that you really, really, really have to use as a gauge of all things new. Dark Chambers. This one's a red label, as described before. That clear. With that red background really popping, you can see there's no bars scrolling back and forth. I'm just kind of one-handing this one with our Sega Master System controller. Make our life a little easier here. As you can see, there's no scrolling. Actually, it's beautiful. All right. Now, with that being said, let's see how this stacks up in HDMI. Okay, guys, there is an HDMI upscaler. This is currently set to, if you look here, 1080. We're just going to go straight to 1080, the hell with it. So, first one we're going to try, good old-fashioned Pac-Man. Now, remember in the standard def, it looked like shit. Most likely because the potentiometer needs to be adjusted. But we'll see how it looks in 1080. And go with a moment of truth. Doesn't even turn on. Okay, it's a little disturbing. Let's readjust the cartridge. That's never a good sound. Let's try that again one more time. You can tell the condition of the cartridge isn't the best. Hmm. And there is Pac-Man. A little disappointing. You can actually see the ghosting in the image. Not good. Not good at all. But then again, this is a not a great cartridge, so it could be the problem with the cartridge itself. Let's try one that we know is aftermarket or reliable. Return of the Jedi. And we'll go with Jedi. See how that looks. Yet Jedi looks absolutely beautiful. That is 1080i Atari 2600. That's pretty badass, guys. Let's try new school Atari towards the end of their run. Oops, sorry about that. Dark Chambers in the, the Red series, if you guys remember those. Maybe, maybe not. You probably upgraded to Nintendos by then. Dark Chambers is pretty clean. You do see a tiny bit of the ghosting right around there. Which is pretty disappointing, too. wonder if some of this can be adjusted simply by adjusting the potentiometer. But yet, when you go to the bold, bright colors, you don't really see it too much. And this game does have a black background, so... Oh, there's the ghost. If You can see it just slightly right there. So that's about it. I gotta say that the win definitely goes for standard def. And that's all there is to it. So tell me what you think on the comments below. If you want to subscribe, go ahead and subscribe. If not, look out for the next video when we do the Atari 5200. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something new. And let me know what you think. And please... We don't need the dumbass comments. We already have plenty of dumbass comments. Uh, I accept all types of criticism, uh, but let's be civil about it and just keep it at criticism. Alright? Sounds good. So next time, it's your boy C coming to you from outer space. Peace out.